My name is June Simeonoff Pardue. I was born in Old Harbor Village on Kodiak Island. And, you know, really, honestly, um, all the island people call Old Harbor Village Nunyak. That's the original name of our village. Uh, my father was born in Ayaktalik Village, uh, which is on the south end of Kodiak, and the village no longer exists. I think because of the epidemic, people moved away from there and migrated to like Akiak and Kaguyak and um, Old Harbor. So that's how my father got to be there. I was born in Old Harbor Village um, and delivered by Alutuk midwives, which was really fascinating. My mother is um, Yupik and Inupiak, and she was born at Pitmaktalik Reindeer Camp. And uh, that was a reindeer camp that was operated by Sinrock Mary, the reindeer queen. And she was her um, office and was out of St. Michael in the Norton Sound. And my mother grew up in uh, St. Michael. I think it's just really fascinating with how we've got this whole mixture of um, cultures that I've been exposed to. Not just the Sukhbiak, but also the Yupik and the Inupiak. We learned a lot of things. My mother was uh, uh, an outdoor person. She loved taking us down to the beach, and not just me, she loved taking all of her children down to the beach when she was harvesting her grass. And talking about dyes, there was um, one location in Old Harbor where the basket weavers loved to pick uh, this uh, purple colored grass, and I believe that's the Vivianite from the earth, you know, and, and how the um, grass just soaked that natural dye up into it. Um, she loved using that when she was weaving her baskets. She took us out to uh, berry pick and she uh, often messed around with dyeing her beach grass with uh, um, berries like blueberries which come out real pretty mauve. Salmon berries didn't uh, produce very much color but she did get color out of the cranberries. I can't remember if it was my aunties and my mom talking, or if it was my mother and Fidocia Inga from Old Harbor talking about uh, using sea urchin juice and making a purpley dye out of it. Not real dark purple. It was, it was more a real light lavender color. Um, I would like to experiment with that someday. I'm trying to think of other dyes that my mom used. She loved working, messing around with, um, natural things. I think she was just raised that way up in Yupik and Inupia country. You know, they always talked about using chips of alder and um, getting them wet and not soaking their fur, but getting it damp so that they could roll it up in um, alder bark, pieces of alder bark. And that's how they got that reddish brownish dye on the skin side for for their uh, garments, you know, for making tassels and whatnot. Jan Steinbright came around and she asked me if I would like to attend that workshop with Rita Blumenstein. I can't remember where it was in Anchorage. I know they rented a real nice hall. Um, so it was so fascinating, really cool, because when I walked into the room I could see all of Rita's dyes in big gallon-sized jars. She and she had them all labeled. They were all labeled with different things. She had um, onion skin dye, really nice orangey yellow color. And she also had blueberry dye. She had, I know she had cranberry dye. Uh, there were some real odd ones, but I can't remember what they were because I know she experimented with squid and got dyes out of squid. Squid ink, they get black. Fish gall, they could get green out of it. I've never tried that one. 
beets, store-bought beets. You can get a nice wine color out of that. I've tried that, and it really does work. It's real rich. And you know, what's, what makes it work, I think, is the uh, peelings in the beets have tannin in them. And whenever there's tannin in um, your natural tannin from whatever you're harvesting, like barks, it's a fixative and the color won't bleed. Berries were brought in and a dye with heat was made out of cranberries and blueberries. We did use the onion skin dye. I remember that vividly. And after we were done, she had a clothesline hanging up and we um, hung all of the grass up, up there. She did talk a lot about all the different dyes and, and told stories too, because that's all part of it, telling stories. And it, um, <clears throat> I know I was just fascinated. I was so happy to be there. And she was part of the reason why I wanted to, well, the main reason was because of my mother. I wanted to copy my mom. But when Rita had her workshop, it, it inspired me. I wanted to try it when I was in my, in my early adult years. And I did. I tried it. And, uh, and um, you know, you get busy with children and raising them and, and, and whatnot. And so I put that away for a side. Um, but today I'm always interested in, in using natural dyes, you know. I think the children who are raised and they see all that activity around them, it just comes natural to them to pick up and to want to follow in their parents' footsteps with whatever they're doing. We always experimented with stuff around the house. Um, I think that's where I got it from, that's from my mom. Being an elder and having to teach people, um, there are times when I do experiment with, um, with even if it's dyeing or if it's um, trying a different weaving technique, um, working with beads and sewing. I'm always trying to stay a little bit ahead of myself so that I can have answers for my students when they ask you know, the questions that could be hard if I didn't know what I was doing. It was wonderful working outdoors, you know, and getting people to just use nature around them to gather uh, things for, for the dyeing workshop. I was just fascinated with the ideas that people came with and, you know, we learn from each other. It's not just um, myself teaching or Destiny teaching. We learn from one another with the, in that workshop which was just wonderful. I mean, I learned a lot from other people, too. I really opened my eyes to what can I use for dyes, you know, and it's like I'm just fascinated that with just what our Earth supplies us with. And the two things that I really, really want to try, like I said before, I want to try the urchins and I want to try mushrooms because I know the mushrooms mixed with lichen you can get a really, really beautiful range of purples. Teaching was a calling for me when the Alaska State Council on the Arts gave me a jingle and said, hey, we hear that you're teaching um, Aleut basket weaving. And at that time, there were only 12 of us in Alaska. We could count on our hands, only 12 of us who were weaving. And then I knew, I always knew when I was a teenager that te teaching Native Arts was a calling in my life, and it really um, was confirmed when I got that phone call from the Alaska State Council on the Arts. Well, they ended up sending me to several different places. I ended up traveling as far down as Ketchikan and teaching at a museum there. We were basket weaving. Another place was in Haines, Anchorage, many places in Anchorage and in the schools and then over to Port Hyden, Chignik Bay, Chignik Lakes. Um, <clears throat> it ended up being 21 different places. But you know what, the calling was beautiful because we were reviving art and <clears throat> reviving culture that had been lost to, to us it, uh, with the Sukhbiak people. And, and to me it was so rewarding 
to be able to see people making their very first headdresses, headdresses that had not been made in, oh, maybe 100 to 200 years. It's the same thing like this fall when I went to Cordova and taught that um, gut, bare gut parka making. It was just amazing, you know, the energy and the pride with the women and, and ownership. You know, they claimed ownership of what they were doing. And I think being a teacher, for me, I want to see that in my students. I want them to take ownership for whatever they are learning to make and what they're making. Because it's not June's project. It's not June's hands on the art. It's theirs. And to have ownership does something to a person, especially if they're making something like that for the very, very first time. And it, and it was a success, and they did it beautifully. They did it together. They put their ideas together. They talked about it. And essentially, a teacher needs to let go and let, let the artist be the artist. Pass the knowledge along. Pass it down to the next generation. Pass it on to someone else. Um, but I think what I want to see in, uh, in someone is that they can be as creative as they want. You know, we have culture. Culture isn't stagnant. It doesn't stand still. Uh, and culture evolves. So if, if they're uh, looking at a beaded head, for instance, looking at a beaded headdress and saying, wow, you know, um, gosh, I, got, I have to use Russian trade beads when I make mine because that's what they made them out of. No, it doesn't have to be that way. We have beads available to us in the store and go for it. Be as creative as you need to be in, with whatever you're making. Stay as close as you can to, like if you're making it for a dance uh, group, try to, st try to stay within the boundaries of what they looked like back then. But, man, I say, go for it and being creative. I don't think we need restriction. I don't believe in restriction when you're an artist and teaching art. <laughs>